Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me out there on this? All right. Welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Ellenberg. I'm here to introduce Dr. Robert Cosson. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things to start with. Uh, first of all, if you have cell phone, most of these days, you put it on mute because you're in talk. You have to take a clear phone call. Please head out there and have a conversation out in the hallway, please. Uh, there'll be time for questions um, at the end of the lecture. So please hold your questions during the lecture itself. And in 15 minutes at the end of the lecture, and also there'll be time to talk about Thompson at the table at the end when he's signing books as well. Okay? Sorry for the feedback there, folks. Uh, so some information about Dr. Thompson here. He graduated from the University of Kentucky College of Medicine in 1977. He completed his internship in pediatrics in 1978 at the University of California, California Irvine. His residency in obstetrics and gynecology was completed at Pennsylvania State University in 1982. He's a board certified in obstetrics and gynecology, and that took place in 1984, and he's practiced in this same subject for 30 years with many certifications in different types of pelvic surgeries. He's also served in the U.S. Army Reserves from 2002 to 2011 as Lieutenant Colonel with distinction. His current medical practice focuses on anti-aging medicine and achieving wellness in his patients. Dr. Thompson has patients all over the world seeking his expertise in the clinical application of tissue mineral analysis, the correct management of hypothyroidism, and state-of-the-art Biomedical hormone replacement therapy. He currently practices, his main practice in Soldatna, and he's also here in Anchorage as well. Dr. Thompson is committed to advancing the practice of medicine in the world his, through his groundbreaking book known as The Calcium Line, written in 2008, and now in his new book, written last year, Calcium Line 2, with his many new observations, uh, conclusions, references, and new health. Revelations. The Calcium Line 2 aims at taking leadership in the field of medicine in the treatment and eradication of osteoporosis, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, the five types of hypothyroidism, and birth defects. The Calcium Line 2 exposes numerous health lies that plague many of us today. And I encourage you all a round of applause for Dr. Robert Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Ellenberg. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Is the house mic on? Yes. Okay. Uh, welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. I know I'm competing with the president, <laughs> but I kind of figured this was an a important message and we didn't actually anticipate that when we scheduled this for tonight. Uh, one of the things that's, uh, that's very significant, uh, I think from an author's standpoint of producing this book is uh, we blew the whistle on the calcium issue in 2008 with the first edition of the Calcium Lie. And it's not very often that you can write a book and then somebody comes along and say, says, well, can you rewrite it? Because we, we can't sell it. We, we want a new copyright date. We can't sell a 2008 book in 2013. And we said, well, yeah, I think we could probably do that because, you know, things change. There's more references. There's more background. There's more information. And, of course, I learned a few things in the last five years. So most of that's in this book, and uh, the, we're very privileged to have the book be coming out internationally. Uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to get out of the way uh, tonight. We are recording, so we can produce a CD and a YouTube uh, video of this lecture tonight. And uh, I wanted to uh, make sure that everyone understood that we're not going to make claims about any specific drug or product or anything like that. We're definitely going to talk about minerals tonight. Um, the information is just, this is for information only. All this information is in my book, including the references. Um, I have my own medical practice and my online company, Aurora Health and Nutrition, that sells products uh, for nutrition, so very, very specific ones that I recommend for very, very specific reasons. Uh, only uh, two of the products are specific for my practice. One is uh, uh, currently not available. And uh, uh, in all, medicine, we have now come to the point where we qualify uh, scientific research based on uh, the, what's considered the, the ultimate standard, which is a level A. In general, just if you all are familiar with that, a level A is a ra randomized prospective study, which is supposed to be the uh, coup, coup de grace, so to speak, of uh, 
uh, a level of, of uh, for sure. Uh, a B uh, study is more of a retrospective study, and a C is ex expert opinion. One of the problems today is all the research is pretty much paid for by drug companies, and so there's no incentive to re research natural products. So we're finding more and more among integrative medicine specialists that our experience with uh, healing and nutrition uh, can oftentimes take precedent over prospective randomized studies. So you'll hear a little bit about that tonight. Um, the, uh, we do sell products through my office and through my online company. But again, these are products that you can get nationally and internationally, and I don't have any specific loyalties to any, any company. I'm only loyal to my patients, and I want them to be sure that they get the best possible for the dollars that they spend on their products. Um, to help you understand a little bit about why this is so significant, I want to just touch base really quick on some of the problems in the field of medicine today. Uh, first of all, uh, cost. Uh, you know, if you've been to the doctor, if you've been to the hospital, if you've had an operation and you've seen your bill, you have some idea of how serious this issue is. Currently, over five times more money is spent in the United States on our health care uh, than our national defense. Five times more. The United States of America actually spends three times more on their health care than any other developed country in the world, and you'll see in a minute why that's so significant. Uh, the United States and Canada actually comprise 5.5% of the world population, and yet um, we use 78% of all the drugs sold worldwide, and uh, a lot of it is wasted on drugs that don't work or that are harmful, uh, that are currently uh, believed to be significant uh, by the medical profession. Probably the best example of that is statin drugs, and uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Most drugs are over 10 times reasonable cost, some are hundreds, and uh, there's almost no research dollars that are spent on non-toxic, less expensive nutritional supplements, often with better results in the hand of integrative specialists. Um, here's one of the things that really kind of like rocks my boat and changes my heart uh, towards uh, everything that I see in the field of medicine. And I've I've, uh, as Dr. Ellenberg uh, said, I've sort of been a rock the boat guy in my practice of medicine since I started, but it's been directly based on literature, information. When I learn something and I realize that this is true and this is good, I can't go back to doing things that, that are, that are, that are uh, now become unacceptable. And so uh, I'm gonna give you the science behind the book a little bit tonight, so this is unique. Uh, but if you look at the United States, the World Health Organization and Central Intelligence Agency, I had no idea until I started telling prepare my book, actually takes health data from countries all over the world, and they do comparisons on that data. Uh, so far, uh, the, the, in one of the organizations, I think they have 195, one goes up to 222 developed countries. We're not talking about third world. We're talking about countries that have doctors, that have hospitals, that have medical care. We actually rank 42nd, and every 10 years we're decreasing. Uh, we actually, uh, in our life expectancy for men, uh, 46, for women, 47th, falling every 10 years. Neonatal survival, we're down to 34th from 23rd 10 years ago. This is scary. We're the number one worst in the world in first day infant mortality. And we think we have the OBGYN and, and neonatal intensive care specialists, and it's gonna make a difference. Uh, heart disease affects almost one in two people in the United States. Uh, cancer is nearly 50%. One in three men get prostate cancer now, one in six women breast cancer. And uh, I believe that this is largely preventable. Dementia it now is over 50%, it's actually over 45% of uh, people that reach age 85. So if you make it past your life expectancy, you're not gonna know it. Um, <laughs> exactly. Autism increases every decade, and uh, 10 years ago it was one in 96 males, currently it's one in 53. This is a health crisis of unprecedented proportion. If you do the math on this, basically by the year 2030, there'll be no normal male babies born in the United States. 100% will be affected by autism unless something changes. So this is a huge crisis. Uh, diabetes now affects one in nine, over 30 million people. Uh, 90 million are pre-diabetic in the United States. By the year 2030, it's estimated that 95% of adults in the United States will be uh, pre-diabetic or diabetic. So I just simply ask, 
which one of these statistics should the medical profession accept or be proud of? What else is going on? Time to new technology. This is, this is a major crisis in the medical profession. Right now we know from information technology that the information in the world and science do, pretty much doubles every two to three years. And yet it takes 17 years for a significant advance in the field of medicine to become standard of care. Now I blew the whistle on calcium in 2008. It's been five years and counting. We cannot continue in the medical profession to continue to recommend calcium and vitamin D to our patients. And we'll hear more about that tonight, obviously. Uh, liability is a big issue in the field of medicine and, and a lot of it's an issue in society also. Uh, we have greed, we have perfection uh, expectations. All these things are tending to defeat the medical profession in lots of different ways. Physicians are guilty so much of practicing beliefs. I hear this all the time. People believe certain things. And yet, the science doesn't support what they believe. Like an example would be statin drugs. Another example would be uh, calcium, the calcium lie. And we'll hear about these lies tonight and how they've become so accepted. Uh, you know, I oftentimes say if you ask 909 out of 1,000 people, uh, what's osteoporosis or also what from your bones, what's everybody say? Calcium, and that's a lie. You can't possibly replace calcium with minerals, osteoporosis, loss of minerals from the bones. So it seems more like medical profession might be practicing a religion. Sad but true. Adequate nutrition is a huge issue, and I hear this question a lot. I have patients that come in and, and they eat healthy, and they say their husband eats fast food and eats unhealthy, and I'm like, well, yeah, really there's no difference as far as nutritional value, and that's kind of scary. So. You can easily eat to be unhealthy, but it's very difficult to eat to be healthy. I firmly believe at this point in our, in our lives, we must supplement in order to achieve optimal health, and we must do so correctly as if our life depends on it. Uh, problems also with our food or contamination, huge issues. Uh, probably the biggest right now, too, that I'm concerned about is glyphosate. That's Roundup. They use almost two pounds per man, woman, and child in the United States. Now in agriculture, it increases every year. It's believed to be the number one cause of insulin resistance. And methyl bromide, uh, which disrupts iodine functions in the body, you will learn about that a little bit more tonight. Uh, basically, uh, uh, methyl bromide is, is uh, known to be associated with prostate, breast, thyroid, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. So bromine disrupts the function of iodine and cancer develops in these organs. And uh, this is a big deal. All your berries at the grocery store are sprayed with methyl bromide. So every time you've eaten strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, every time you've uh, eaten any bread or flour products for the, over the past 30 years, you've been receiving toxic levels of bromine into your body. They also use it in swimming pools, spas, and hot tubs. Big concern. Uh, there, here, this is an interesting thing, and I actually had a patient said his dad was a doctor, and he told me, he says his dad told him, he said when medicine became big business, it lost its credibility. It's no longer a service occupation, and this has created huge problems for our patients and, and, and uh, uh, from the financial aspect of the practice of medicine. Also, I, I, I really have a huge issue with this sort of stuff. Um, there's a lot of problems in the system. There's a great deal of protecting the status quo going on, especially in the medical profession where they want to protect their income. Whoever wants more, whoever, who wants less income? Nobody does, neither does the medical profession, but at some point it's out of hand. It's just, it shouldn't cost $5,000 to go to the ER for a sprained ankle, uh, which is what my neighbor's cost was. We talked about the drugs, we talked about the science, we talked to the about the cost. Who wants the government to be responsible for their health care? I don't think any of us do, and yet that's what we're hearing in the United States uh, today is that, is that they're going to determine what quality of health care that you could have in the future, and this is a problem. So when I, I began this uh, trend uh, in my practice, probably in the late 90s, I discussed this in the book pretty much in detail, chapter 10, um, and I sat there one day as I was trying to figure out what changed? Uh, what caused civilization to change? I, I just, I sat there, uh, you know, I often am up until two, two or three in the morning, sometimes when I'm writing or I'm working, and I get clear thoughts at those times, and I realized it was refrigeration was the greatest change in our nutrition and the history of civilization. Uh, the reason is because we all of a sudden quit using sea salt to preserve our meat and our fish. There's lots of stories. One of my favorites is about Boonesboro, how they had to sneak out in the middle of the night to, to go uh, 
uh, you know, scarf up some salt because they had plenty of food, but they couldn't keep it. It was all going to spoiling and they knew they were going to run out, so they'd sneak out and get salt. So everything had to be salted. Next problem that happened is they got smart and they decided that, okay, we're going to make this pretty white table salt that doesn't clump. And uh, so after about doing that for about 10 years and uh, mental retardation, cretinism, which is still the number one cause of mental retardation worldwide today, is uh, still out there and uh, goiters. And so they, uh, they added potassium iodide to our salt. And unfortunately, that's only one of the forms of iodine we need. And today, nobody's using enough salt because everybody thinks they, they do, it's, it's bad for them. Drug dependency, the, the, gradually the pill, pill became the answer. Medical school, I tell uh, my, my colleagues, I said, I think what happened is they did a lobotomy on us. We learned all this science and technical information the first two years of medical school, and all of a sudden in the third and fourth year of medical school, and from there on, every disease process in the field of medicine had either a deficiency of a drug or an operation or radiation or chemo or something like that. Lord knows it couldn't be our nutrition. So we also have this deception going on, uh, and I call it the parentheses. Every time you look at your multis and your vitamins and your ascorbic acid, everything that's sold over the market today, there's always a parentheses. So they'll say like vitamin C, parentheses, as ascorbic acid. When you see that parentheses, that usually means we are lying to you. And I'll explain to you why that is tonight. Dairy industry, uh, I think they're responsible for the, the, the false advertising. I mean, they got fined $8 million and had to take the commercial, milk does a body good, off, off the air uh, regarding this, this, this uh, false information. There's clearly uh, no uh, significant um, uh, benefit to milk in our diet. Uh, unfortunately, it's pasteurized, it becomes very toxic, and if you start looking at the chemicals, uh, it's scary. If you go to notmilk.com, it's a great source for learning more about this. This is also, that's also in the book. Capitalism, um, you know, this is just greed gone awry. Uh, there's just no accountability for it. Everybody will sell you a supplement, but nobody will take responsibility for the fact that it's going to help you get better or it's going to help treat your medical problems. And so this is, a, this is a big problem, lack of accountability. And then, of course, mineral deficiency, which we're going to talk about tonight. A lot of the diseases that we've come to believe are normal did not exist 100 years ago. And we'll talk about why that is. Obviously, it's a refrigeration and sea salt issue. Um, so these are the most common nutritional lies that we all have learned to believe, and they are lies. Uh, they are not true. There is absolutely no truth in them. I have over 2,000 patients and 13 or 14 years experience now with tissue mineral analysis. I can tell you that 90% of our population has extra calcium in their body, too much calcium, 90%. So everyone taking calcium that already has too much, they're making themselves worse. Watch your sodium. This is wrong also for 90% of the world. You can't digest protein and you can't get glucose or amino acids into a single cell in your body without sodium. And 90% and of our population is deficient. Don't eat eggs. How many think eggs are bad for you? We got a couple, but you guys are, must be more well informed than most people. Eggs. Uh, the yolk of the egg is the most similar to human protein of all known sources. The yolk is pure HDL cholesterol, no bad fat in, in eggs, period. It's how you cook them that makes a difference. If you take that yolk and you scramble it, it becomes completely toxic, bad, rancid. It's called uh, lipid peroxide fat. So you never want to eat a scrambled egg. You never want to eat anything that has a yolk in it that's been ruptured and heated. As long as that yolk is intact, over easy, over hard, with the membrane protecting it, it's 100% good for you. And you should eat more. I know, when I first learned that, my mouth dropped open too. I've seen a few people that happen. Um, take your vitamins, uh, the, that deception, we talked about that. And knowing the problems to avoid uh, is a big deal. Which toxins are affecting us the most? Uh, the organophosphates, the, the glyphosate, the bromine, the chemicals, the, the metals. I've got, I think there's about, in Dr. Starr's book on type 2 hypothyroidism, which uh, he published in 2006, he has a whole page of all the chemicals and ingredients that are disrupting our thyroid function. It's, it's very, very scary. Before we pro progress too far in this lecture, I want to make it clear that we're talking about ionic minerals. These are the salt form minerals that your body uses. You, you, they conduct electricity. They can... Uh, dissolve in water completely. 
They can cross semipermeable membranes and they donate electrons. This is the most important uh, aspect of minerals in our body. They donate the electrons for our biochemical reactions to take place at a, as a, at a constant temperature without heat like you would do with like a Bunsen burner in a laboratory or when you're cooking something. And uh, chelated minerals are basically rock form mineral, minerals. They're minerals that have amino, amino acids attached. They can be corrective if you know that you need them and you're deficient. But more often they contribute to imbalances because people are taking them without knowing if they really need them. So you're going to hear me say repeatedly, you have to know for sure. Colloidal, this is uh, actually what first got me started into this, uh, this uh, direction as far as my practice of medicine. I think I sat in this auditorium, this very auditorium in about 1996 and I listened, or 97, I listened to Dr. Wallach, Joel Wallach, talk about colloidal minerals. I knew there was something the matter because he was being critical of too many people. And, and you won't hear me criticize anybody. And I'm very proud of my son for that also. He, he's very good on interviews when they ask him things which would be critical of others. He's always very complimentary and says, well, he respectfully disagrees when somebody wants to get him to say something uh, or agree with something somebody else has said that's bad. Colloidal minerals basically are, uh, they don't conduct electricity. They can't cross semipermeable membranes. If they get into the human body, which they now have some forms that do more efficiently, they literally cannot enter into the cells, so they stay in between your cells. This is why uh, colloidal silver is commonly associated with a, a, a tarnished or a black, uh, dark skin, darkening of your skin. They accumulate over time and eventually through like silver they tarnish and uh, you get this black, dark color in your skin. Here, here's the basics of the calcium. If anybody does construction in here, they'll know very quickly, how do you want to harden concrete? You add calcium. And so calcium hardens concrete. Uh, women's health study actually showed, this was about 100 and, I think 120,000 nurses uh, that they had follow, have now followed for a long, long time. They've done, probably generated more research studies uh, and uh, conclusions from, from this data than anything else that's ever been done in the field of medicine that I know of. Um, and this is, this is their conclusion, 50% increased fracture risk with the highest calcium intake. So did it help prevent any osteoporosis fractures? No, they actually increased. Calcium leads to kidney stones, gallstones, bone spurs, plaque calcium deposits, uh, cataracts, brain shrinkage, and dysfunction. We're going to talk about that tonight a little bit. Numerous medical problems, heart disease, hardening of the arteries, dementia cancer, diabetes, hypothyroidism, and over 90% of hypertension, I believe, is contributed to by this low sodium and high calcium issue. Numerous studies in meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is basically when somebody takes a bunch of studies and combines all the data and makes conclusions out of it. And a meta-analysis, reviewers agree calcium is not the answer, but now they're kind of saying take less. They're still not getting the message. We need minerals. We can't replace minerals with calcium. How do we replace minerals with minerals? So I always tell all my patients, the answer to all the questions I ask is minerals. So get your calcium as a failed hypothesis. We don't need to research it anymore. We don't need any more studies. They'll never be the answer for osteoporosis or bones. We cannot possibly replace minerals by calcium alone. We must replace minerals with balanced sea salt. It's almost scary, I mean, I don't, you know, I may be an educated guy, but I think so, so are so many other doctors and scientists in the United States, and I, I don't understand why it's so hard for them to grasp this, this basic concept. Uh, this is one of the first studies that came out. This is a prospective randomized trial, so it's level A, and uh, they almost 1,500 participants. They started at age 74, and they, re, they gave them 1,000 milligrams per day of uh, calcium, and they were doing a five-year study to assess the effects on bone density and fracture risk. And they showed basically double the number of cardiac events, stroke, and sudden death, uh, and, and, and almost uh, twice as many women uh, in less than five years with taking calcium. There's another study that came out in Europe that showed the same thing in less than two years. Here's the, uh, the kind of the slam dunk on calcium. Uh, Bolin wrote this article in 2010, so obviously this came out after the first book. So it's a meta-analysis, so it's a comparison of all the in combination of all the data from 15 randomized controlled trials of at least 500 milligrams of calcium daily and people over age 40 follow up at least 
3.6 years, over 8,000 people. They showed at least a 31% increase in myocardial infarction with a statistically significant p-value. If you don't know statistics, anything less than 0 0.05 is considered statistically significant. 11 studies with comparable data showed myocardial infarction increased 27%. So I say 30% increase in, in heart disease and, and a myocardial infarction. Stroke increased 20%, and this was still statistic, statistically significant. And myocardial infarction, stroke, sudden death taken together, 18%. This was just below statistical significance. And sudden death increased 9%, which did not achieve statistical significance. Here's the problem with these studies is there, there was really no reliable information comparing pre-existing intracellular calcium levels on these patients because no tissue mineral analysis was employed in any of these studies. The treatment group and controls were preparable only based on age not on diet history or previous history of calcium supplementation, so they really had no equal starting point. They also um, did not control for cholesterol levels or ascorbic acid use or plaque already present in the arteries, which can now be determined definitively through CT scanning. If you're over 50 and you're male, you should have a CT heart scan. You either have plaque or you don't. We'll talk about why tonight, but calcium, of course, is, a, is an important factor. If you don't have it, Chances are you're not going to die from heart disease. If you have it, let's figure, figure out what to do about it. Uh, assume uh, that it assumes that the incidence of hypothyroidism is equal in, or the same in both groups, and we don't know that for sure either. Uh, and nevertheless, when you take all these things together, the problems with these studies, it, they were highly statistically significant. So you've heard me say, Dr. Ellenberg said this in his reduction, that osteoporosis can be eliminated. I don't think it can just be eliminated. I think it's a completely preventable disease. It should not exist. And it's a merely nutritional deficiency across the entire population. So let's look at why. Um, how do you define osteoporosis, a loss of minerals from the bones? That's pretty, pretty simple. It's not defined as a loss of calcium from the bones. It's a loss of minerals. Uh, it's treated to this day incorrectly by weight-bearing exercise, calcium, vitamin D, hormone, estrogen, calcitonin, biophosphonate drugs. So basically, calcium, vitamin D, and drugs are the treatment for osteoporosis today. You don't hear anything about get your minerals. Even Dr. Oz a couple months ago told everybody to stop their calcium, but he didn't give them the, you the correct message. It should be that we need minerals, all of us, a minimum of three grams a day. No good reason, this is quite simple, there's no good reason for declines in minerals as we age except inadequate intake. That's it, that's the only reason. Osteoporosis is inadequate intake of minerals, period. There's no other, no other acceptable reason um, although there are certain diseases, and you know, people can, I'm not going to say an all or none, but in most cases, this is correct. Um, correct treatment must include replacement of minerals, a minimum of three grams a day. That's about what we lose every day. So if you're already deficient, you probably need more than three grams a day. If you're doing the mineral tablets that I recommend, that's about six a day. If you're doing the liquid, that's about a teaspoon and a half. Um, pregnancy. I'm an OBGYN doctor, and when I first learned this stuff, I, and I was in shock because I realized that the um, obstetrics and gynecology, uh, American College of OBGYN, and I have spoken specifically to the, the uh, chairman of the board of the obstetrics and gynecology for the United States, Dr. Gant, Norm Gant, and, to, and, and I actually gave him a copy of my book in 2008. Nothing has been done, nothing has changed, nobody's listening, and this is probably one of the most significant nutritional insults that a woman can experience in her lifetime. With every pregnancy, over four pounds of minerals is lost. And how do I figure that? It's basically 28%. Our bodies are 72% water on the average and 28% minerals. So when the baby comes out, guess what the baby's made out of? 72% water, 28% minerals. So by the time you include the weight of, average weight of a placenta, the average weight of the amniotic fluid and the average weight of the baby, that's over four pounds of minerals. Uh, that's eight bottles, uh, half pound bottles of minerals lost during pregnancy just to the baby. And this has not been addressed by the medical profession. This is a huge, huge issue. Um, so osteoporosis, I say, is a modern nutritional disease. It's probably one of the best examples of nutritional disease that we've ever seen in the history of the field of medicine. To expect a decline in the mineral levels over the age is merely documentation of mineral deficiency across the entire aging population. It should never be considered normal or expected. I'm the first person in the world to ever make this statement, and I'm like, uh, it's a no-duh. It's obvious. 
Uh, there is no excuse for declining mineral levels except inadequate intake. So here's the reason. We don't use enough sea salt. All of us in this room, every single one of us should be using sea salt. My office, my staff, myself, I usually carry it around in my pocket and uh, I'm always using more salt. When I'm sitting at the table and I'm using salt, I put salt on until everybody notices that I put so much salt on. And then I stop and as soon as I'm sure they're all looking, I put a little bit more on. And uh, you know, I've been watching my salt levels for the past 13 years and I know what they are. I know I need, need more. Normal's 22, I'm up to 13. I started out at, at about six. So uh, the lack of minerals in our food is the next problem, a lack of vine ripening. Most of the fruits and vegetables in the store aren't picked ripe, so you lose uh, about uh, almost I think it's 80% of the minerals are absorbed during the ripening phase. That's in my book. Uh, soil de mineral depletion, they've been farming repeatedly without resting the soil every seven years, all that sort of stuff. And so uh, pouring more fertilizer on all the time to get things to grow. And our soil, they, then they stop natural flooding. I review all this stuff in chapter one of the book. It's a big, big deal. And this has been going on for about 70 years. I think it was 1934, there was a guy that presented a paper to the United States Congress. I don't remember the name. It's in my book. Anyway, he talked about this, that this has been going on for since in the 19. 30s and improper supplementation. I so commonly hear patients say, oh, there's minerals in my vitamins. Well, they're chelated. You don't even know if you need them. They might be the wrong ones for you, and they're going to contribute to further imbalances as if you already have them. So they're, they're usually always wrong uh, and contraindicated. Uh, so that means really bad for you. So uh, uh, no, you need to know what you need. This is my example. Now, I, I actually took this with, with my iPhone and, you know, and, and turned it into a slide. I think that's so cool, you know, but uh, so it's kind of like not formal or anything like that. But if you look at this graph, the lines that are going down are the normal expected tissue mineral analysis or uh, bone density tests. This happens to be for the hip, the spine and the, and the, the entire uh, hip joint is pretty much the same. So the United States medical profession has concluded that since everybody's mineral levels are declining, it must be normal. And so if you're declining, but you're staying within the same boundaries of between these two lines, your T-score stays the same and you think your bone density is fine and yet it's really not. Uh, normal values, there's no excuse for decline, so I drew these straight lines on here. This is what it should be, and there should be no, ex no accepting of declines. So if bones were made of calcium, that would be one thing. We would probably be more like chalk when you think about it. It's mostly calcium. Uh, so what are our bones made out of? These are the, these are the uh, I think, 12 minerals that are most uh, high concentration in the minerals, but there's actually uh, a total of 84 elements in the human body because 85 is acetine, we'll see that in a minute, and six of them are gases, five inert. So if you just do the math, you take six from 84, there's about 76 ionizing minerals in the human body. Strontium is commonly used in Europe. It's not, notice it's not part of this problem, it's, but yet it's being used worldwide to treat osteoporosis, a lot less in the United States. But if you understand mineral physiology, you'll discover that strontium is an interfering mineral. It, it goes up and down with calcium to protect the body from excess calcium. When it gets incorporated into bone, it forms abnormal bone uh, or knobs which can't be reabsorbed. And you notice them first in the hands. So if you have a high calcium, you typically have a high strontium and it's contributing to osteoarthritis, I'm sure. Uh, known calcium excess related diseases. Obviously, if you have gallstones or kidney stones, you should be rushing to get a hair tissue mineral analysis to find out what your calcium level is because you're gonna get all the other problems related to excess calcium next. Uh, osteoar and yet this is not done. This is not done by any doctors in the United States today except those that are maybe in the integrative uh, field and many of those are still not up to snuff on tissue mineral analysis. Osteoarthritis, dementia, brain shrinkage, and dysfunction. This is sort of a new discovery in the last 10 years. Probably the number one cause of dementia in the United States is get your calcium. It shrinks the brain, it causes synaptic dysfunction, and it destroys memory cells. Bone spurs, calcific plaque, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, type 2 hypothyroidism, cataracts. Every one of these diagnoses requires a hair tissue mineral analysis uh, to further clarify and define the extent of calcium and to begin to make changes before worse, more debilitating disease or recurrent disease becomes uh, uh, part of your physiology. 
So in my book, I discussed this calcium cascade, and, and it's been featured worldwide. Actually, it was featured in Australia. Um, I didn't really dream it up. It's not something new or different. This is basic physiology that we learned in our first year of medical school as we study the kidney function and things like that. Calcium and magnesium in the body are very, very important minerals, and they need to be in balance. And you'll hear people a lot of times they'll be taking magnesium uh, because they think they need it. And I always say, you got to know for sure. But if these two minerals are, are out of proportion, too much calcium, not enough magnesium, the muscles go into tetany, which is basically continuous contraction. It starts out with increased tone and then gradually leads, leads to continuous contractions. And you can see this with people with certain toxic conditions like cancer that force their calcium up. Suppression of adrenal function has to occur for the body to retain magnesium to compensate for the calcium excess. And this is the problem. So what happens is the adrenal glands are suppressed, not only is your immune system compromised and all the diseases which are blamed on, for instance, vitamin D deficiency may in fact be related to this suppression of the adrenal function. I'm not sure which came first, the cart or the horse in this, but the bottom line is this is what happens and you begin a, a, a cascade of sodium and potassium loss in the urine which you can't stop as long as that calcium is in excess or relative excess in the human physiology. And uh, so it doesn't even have to be high, but if it's high in proportion to your other minerals, you'll get this happening. The next thing that happens uh, is the sodium deficiency, and doctors have forgotten how incredibly critical sodium is to the body's physiology. You, you can't get a single amino acid or glucose into a single organ cell of your body, your brain, your liver, your heart, your skin. Everything needs uh, sodium in order to absorb glucose and amino acids. So when you deplete the sodium because you think it's bad for you, because you don't realize you're deficient, you're going to have more problems. One of the most common I see is heartburn, which is low sodium in 90% of the cases. And we know that over 50% of the population, over 50 now has hypochlorhydria, failure of stomach acid production. And this stomach acid is important for protein digestion. Uh, so if you, you eat protein and you're deficient in it, you get bloating, gas, constipation, and you can't get amino acids and glucose into your cells, except fat cells. Fat cells can keep growing and absorbing glucose without sodium. Isn't that a shock, huh? And uh, so this leads to various amino acid deficiency diseases, which we're going to discuss today. And most of all these amino acid deficiency diseases now have a drug to treat them, and it's just a low sodium problem. Potassium deficiency is the other problem, and this is responsible for the cell membrane physiology. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, just a quick overview. And uh, I actually learned about that after the first book. And uh, like everybody else in the world, I thought that there was such a thing as a sodium pump. And that was actually discovered not to exist. And there's over 56 articles now that have shown there's no such thing. Uh, the potassium pump is still being taught in every college and university in the United States today, or almost everyone, and it doesn't exist. It's another lie. So potassium deficiency leads, actually leads to thyroid hormone resistance, slowed metabolism, and is maybe the number one cause of obesity with get your calcium, as well as numerous symptoms of clinical hypothyroidism, which should be diagnosed by basal body temperature, as well as blood tests and hair tissue meta-analysis. We're gonna learn a little bit more about that. Linus Pauling is credited with saying you can you can, you can uh, trace every sickness, every disease, and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. I would add, uh, not to correct him, but just to add or mineral imbalance because you, these mineral balances are what affect most of our body's physiology. So we're going to learn a little bit more about that. As I was doing this uh, studying, which, you know, I seem to be pretty possessed with this stuff. <laughs> uh, I discovered back in 1999 a principle of mineral substitution based on uh, this guy, uh, uh, Mr. Doberiner, Dr. Doberiner, back in 1917 was a chemist who was involved in the discovery of minerals and the establishment of the periodic table of the elements. And he actually began to predict the existence of minerals based on their physiology because they had similar chemical properties. And so he knew there was another mineral that he hadn't identified yet based on the fact that it had a slightly different melting point, slightly different boiling point, all that stuff that you learn in organic chemistry. So I thought about this for a while and I realized that I've kept observing this principle in human physiology and illness. And I believe now this discovery is the basis for m much human disease that we see in the world uh, today. Uh, it's due to one mineral being substituted for another. 
uh, to try to meet the demands of the body for the, to overcome the deficiency. But unfortunately, those minerals don't perform equally and they end up leading to disease. And uh, we're, I'm going to show you how to apply this in a minute. Uh, again, this is expert opinion. So this is uh, from Encyclopedia Britannica, your typical periodic table of the elements. And I want you to focus on three things, three minerals. And it, it, they kind of go together and you can see it really quickly once somebody points it out to you. So we know sodium is really important in the body, so we would expect, so would potassium, lithium, and we would expect these, possibly lithium, to interfere with potassium because it has bio, similar biochemical properties. And we know that happens and it causes hypothyroidism. I call that type six. We know that uh, strontium can be substituted for calcium and calcium magnesium ratio is very important. So all these three minerals are very important in the body's physiology. We know that cadmium increases risk of breast cancer over 40 times, but because it, it's a hormone disruptor of the, uh, of the copper zinc balance, which is critical for estrogen function in the body. We know that bromine can be substituted for iodine. Here's where they exist on the periodic table. And we know that chlorine also can interfere with iodine, but it's more volatile, so it comes out of the body when bromine tends to be retained. So this, these, this observation of these triads and their interaction in human disease is just beginning. Uh, you know, obviously, I, I might be the one that discovered it because I've never heard of anybody else talk about this before. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a very significant uh, aspect of, of what, where medicine needs to go in the future. So here's a couple examples in the molecular weights. Usually when you see an increase in eight, it's like a scale on a piano. And so there's a middle C and then a higher C. And, this, uh, and these minerals, as long as they're in the same grouping, uh, like we saw just a minute ago, they will tend to interact or interfere or substitute for each other. So here's some examples, bromine for iodine, endocrine disruptor at a carcinogen leading to increased risk of endocrine organ tumors and cancer, cysts uh, and uh, all kinds of problems. I discussed this extensively in the calcium lie. Strontium for calcium, we already mentioned that, how it causes abnormal bone formation. And lithium for potassium, uh, this lead, leads to uh, hypothyroidism. This is already proven. And uh, I call it type 6 hypothyroidism. It's, this is not in the book, so you're learning that tonight. Uh, this is the first time I've actually presented this information about type 6 hypothyroidism publicly. Uh, but it's, uh, it's in my lecture now on hypothyroidism. I'd only seen one case of it occur spontaneously prior to publishing this last book, so I, I didn't include it. Now I've seen five cases I know it, uh, that occur spontaneously without lithium substitution uh, for or treatment for bipolar disorder, which is what it was used for in the past. Now they use other drugs, of course. Cadmium, uh, mercury interfere with zinc and uh, the zinc copper balance. And you can see these, how close these mineral molecular weights are and why they, they have, it's so important that they're in balance and they, how they can interfere with each other is pretty obvious. So Hippocrates, think about this, 3,000 years ago suggested our food should be our medicine. And he also said something that I, can, I discovered after I wrote the first book that I considered highly significant. He said there are in effect two things, to know and to believe one knows. To know for sure is science, to believe one knows is ignorance. And when I talk about medical profession believing what they know, uh, it's ignorance. Uh, we must doubt it. We must doubt everything we think we know and be what we call epistemocrats. So, um, and I did learn that word uh, from another author and I thought, wow, that's a great word, epistemocrat. Doubt what we think we know. So how do we find out what our mineral analysis levels are in the body? We use micro mass spectrophotometry. And unfortunately, there are many in the medical profession who try to tell you that this isn't reliable and it's this, that, and the other, and it's quack medicine and things like that. They're absolutely ignorant. They have not done their homework in every single case. I can tell you that absolutely for sure. This technology is relied on by every chemistry lab in the entire world. This, this is used on the Mars rover to determine the mineral content of the Mars soil. It's been considered reliable, acceptable, reproducible. Uh, knowing the mineral content of the human body is very, very important, especially knowing the ratios. It's essential to every medical decision, every supplement decision. Every aspect of your body's health is dependent on knowing what these minerals are. If you know you have low sodium, you pour it on. If you know you have high calcium, you avoid it. It's really pretty simple. And uh, hair tissue mineral analysis is the most important health test, in my opinion, that we can ever have done in our lifetime. Because not only will it tell us 
uh, what's going on now, but it'll actually predict which illnesses and diseases we're going to develop in the future if we don't change our nutrition. And we have no other way of knowing reliably how to do that except through tissue mineral analysis. And we can use other tissues. I don't have time to get into a discussion as far as, you know, why red blood cells aren't as reliable as this uh, hair, hair. What are the problems with hair tissue mineral analysis? And there are a few, it, but correct sampling is really the key in every case. I always tell my patients, there's no such thing as a bad hair tissue mineral analysis. It's just really good to have it and really bad not to. And those of you that are here tonight, obviously you got it, uh, or if you haven't picked it up, be sure and get one. You can get a coupon if, uh, for half, 50% uh, off approximately on, on your hair tissue mineral analysis just for coming out tonight uh, to make it worth your worthwhile. Um, so here's an example in medicine of a huge error that's been made. And when we restrict sodium, we actually pretty much condemn people to get gastric acid problems. We talked about the hypochloridia. And I, I, I realize that this is a paradoxical problem because paradoxical is kind of like the opposite of what you would expect. So you restrict sodium and your body can't make stomach acid. Stomach acid requires sodium chloride in the parietal cells of the stomach, which is where the acid comes from. We know that over 50% of the human population suffers from this low stomach acid and poor protein digestion, which kind of fits the 90% that are sodium deficient. Undigested protein in the upper gastrointestinal tract stimulates a hormone to be released by the pancreas called gastrin, and it's this gastrin that stimulates the parietal cells to produce more stomach acid. So the way I talk about it in my book, I realize it's kind of like the old cars where you had carburetors. Uh, some of you all are old enough to remember that when we had carburetors and you had to pump the gas to start the car before we had like points and injection and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, uh, what happens is it's like flooding the car. If you kept pumping and it didn't start, pretty soon you flooded the engine and that's what happens. That's why these patients get GERD. It's very reversible, by, mostly by just correcting sodium levels over time. And when I treat these patients, I try to use an acid absorber as opposed to an acid suppressor. So they take enough of the absorber to keep the acid from causing symptoms and not enough to disrupt their ability to digest protein because I really want those amino acids to get into the body. Excess acid um, uh, then leads to also suppression uh, of further protein digestion and it also, uh, it, as we've talked about previously, keeps uh, the amino acids from getting into the cells in your body when you need them. High sodium GERD also occurs and this is interesting, but it only affects about 10% of the population. And you can have high sodium for quite a while before it begins to affect you, but it definitely will eventually. And uh, this is quite a minority. These patients are probably the most uh, serious as far as their stomach acid because uh, they have a continuous overproduction of the acid, which is exacerbated by protein intake. And, uh, and they get chronic acid issues, especially esophagitis, which can increase esophageal cancer risk. Uh, but again, this is a small minority. These patients typically need a suppression drug for their acid until the sodium excess is resolved. Once that resolves, then the stomach acid problem should go away. Um, once again, we have to know the body's mineral levels of these essential minerals to treat patients correctly. And I, re again, repeat what Hippocrates said 3,000 years ago about the having to know. We got to know for sure. So if you can't get amino acids into your cells and your body, these amino acids are very important to your body's physiology. Certain things are going to happen. The most common uh, is this disruption of this electrical pump, which is it's electrical phenomena that's responsible for our ability to get glucose and amino acids into the cells. It's a charge on our cell membranes and it's the basis of our MRI technology that we use today in the field of medicine. And this was all dis described by uh, a guy named, uh, uh, as AI hypothesis by Dr. Ling in 1964. So this is not new information. There's over 56 articles now that have been published that confirm his work. And not one article has ever confirmed that a sodium pump exists and yet it's still taught in every major college and university and high school in the United States. Um, this is an electrical phenomenon. It actually is most relying on potassium uh, because you have a potassium on the beta and the gamma carbon inside implanted on the cell membrane and that's what creates this electrical potential. So the problem is basically two things. Sodium limits the ability uh, for your to be able to digest your protein and it limits the ability to get these amino acids into the cells. So this causes the development of amino acid deficiency diseases as well as the type 2 hypothyroidism. So what are some examples of that? Uh, 
uh, and what are the amino acids that are most significant. I think uh, I've concluded in, as I wrote this book, uh, this last book, that almost all cardiovascular disease, vascular disease, all plaque in the arteries is probably caused by vitamin C deficiency. We're going to talk more about that. I'm not the first person to suggest that. I'm just the first person to suggest it correctly because the people that have suggested before me didn't realize that ascorbic acid is not vitamin C. It depletes vitamin C from the body. So uh, the vitamin C actually has an enzyme in it called tyrosinase, and obviously tyrosine is a part of that molecule. And uh, this deficiency enables your body to not be able to utilize copper, so you can't build strong connective tissue. So your artery walls, especially where there's the greatest pressure near the heart, get leaky, and the body heals it with a patch. That's plaque. So it's a healing response to vitamin C deficiency, in my opinion. Um, hypertension. Um, if you, do, if you can't get L-arginine into your cells because of low sodium, you can't produce nitric oxide, you can't dilate your blood vessels, and so hypertension has become rampant in the United States. Obesity, uh, you have to have this leucine amino acid in order for you to have insulin receptors in the body, and so this obesity has contributed to this and organophosphate and chemicals which are disrupting these things. And then there's a couple types of hypothyroidism that are related to this. Certainly the excess calcium leads to low sodium and low potassium and, and the thyroid hormone resistance, I call this type two in the first book. And then a type one occurs with a lack of tyrosine from low sodium. If you can't get tyrosine into your thyroid, you can't make thyroid hormone. So, also, you have to have the C molecule with the enzyme tyrosinase to make thyroid hormone. Bromine toxicity is a disruptor of that, and selenium deficiency occurs. Migraine headaches, depression, insomnia are known to be associated with serotonin deficiency, which is 5-hydroxy uh, tri or tryptophan, the amino acid. So these are some of the important amino acids in the diseases that are associated with the methionine. It's a methyl donor, very, very important. I generally put all my patients on it because it's very inexpensive and it's very beneficial to the body's physiology. I discuss it on page 78 of my book. Um, energy production, enzyme activity, cellular replication, gene expression, homocysteine metabolism, heavy metal detoxification, elimination, all that is functioned from this one amino acid that if you're sodium deficient, you can't get into your cells. We talked about arginine, essential for nitric oxide production and ability to dilate blood vessels, heal wounds, cell division, erections, hormone function, hormone release, growth hormone, myelin, sheath formation, RNA transcription, DNA repair, autoimmune disease, and more. I actually have observed with most of my patients, they seem to do better with arginine at bedtime than even uh, taking somatotropins to increase growth, growth hormone. Uh, amino acid deficiency diseases, uh, here's some more tryptophan, depression, insomnia, migraines, increased appetite contributing to obesity. Uh, melatonin comes from tryptophan, so this is a contributing factor to insomnia. Uh, tyrosine, also a little, a little pearl that's in my book. The correct dose of melatonin is 200 micrograms, which is about two sprays of the supplement that I recommend. It says on the bottle three. Most people are taking it in milligram strengths, swallowing it, goes through your liver, gets metabolized, doesn't really do anything. So you have to do it as a, a, a transmucosal application to get the best results. And if you go over 500 micrograms, it increases cortisol and causes you to wake up frequently through the night. So tyrosine, look at all the things tyrosine, this amino acid does uh, in, the, in the human body. So thyroid hormone takes two tyrosine molecules, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine require uh, tyrosine and are very important with the gross anxiety and stress issues. Insulin receptors require this molecule. CoQ10 requires this molecule, and adrenal in, uh, issues are often related to the deficiency of this amino acid. Glycine, we talked about that with, uh, very important with regards to the formation of glutathione, which is important for the heart. Lysine is important for collagen formation. Serine is important for amino acids. Uh, uh, activation of ener enzymes, energy formation, neurotransmitter synthesis, memory, and threonine is important for protein synthesis and energy generation. So I review all this in my book, chapter four, and it's, it's very important that we understand that uh, amino acids, uh, most illnesses, diseases for which they have drugs a day, there's probably an amino acid deficiency disease that's related to it. Um, so, hair tissue mineral analysis, how does that change or improve the treatment of hypertension? No, 90% of the patients worldwide are being treated incorrectly for their hypertension by not knowing their mineral levels. This is a very important statement. No one's ever said it before. 
Uh, I'm absolutely 100% totally convinced that after over 2,000 patients, this is absolutely accurate. It will be confirmed in time. But again, this, is, this should be considered level C. Uh, this, is, this is my experience and my expertise. So there's two types of hypertension, basically low sodium and high sodium. And everybody doesn't need to watch their sodium. Those that are low, they need more sodium. And as a matter of fact, it can be corrective because what happens, you can begin to get the arginine back into your cells and dilate your blood vessels and your blood processor problem goes away. Almost always, this is associated with low potassium and hypothyroidism, which is also proven to contribute to increased blood pressure. Um, hydrochlorothiazide is commonly used it's actually one of the first line treatments in hypertension, and it actually depletes sodium and potassium, so it would be contraindicated in these patients. That's a strong word that says don't use it. Uh, spironolactone is both therapeutic and corrective in this group, so I use a lot of spironolactone in my practice to help correct low potassium levels, which is 90% of our population. And it, I try to use it temporarily because I'm not into using drugs, but I want to correct the problem as, as efficiently and as effectively as I possibly can. ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers are corrective and therapeutic in these patients and should be used uh, if you're going to need a medication. Calcium channel blockers are also helpful due to the high calcium, so any one of those drugs would probably be useful in the low sodium hypertension patient. The high sodium hypertension patient is a completely different different group. And these patients can have just high sodium or high sodium and potassium. Usually the, first the sodium goes up and then eventually the potassium goes up. If the potassium is high, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are completely contraindicated. These are the number one drugs used for treatment of hypertension in the United States today. 90% of the time, they're the wrong medicines. And uh, hydrochlorothiazide, however, is therapeutic and corrective in this group. However, if they still have a low potassium, aldactazide, which is a combination of hydrochlorothiazide and spironolactone, would be better for those patients. And, uh, it's not possible, a lot of times if you look at the PDR, all the information on drugs and things like that is commonly refers to, oh, this, this medicine or that medicine could be associated with increased potassium. And I can tell you that if the intracellular potassium level in the body is significantly depleted, you could take potassium in huge amounts for a long period of time before you're gonna correct your potassium levels. It's just really not ever gonna hurt you until that intracellular potassium level goes above normal. Once it goes above normal, there's no buffer it's very toxic. It's gonna to go up in the blood very rapidly in those patients. So knowing, once again, will keep you out of trouble. Beta blockers and, and alpha blockers are probably preferred in these patients. Calcium channel blockers may be okay if the calcium isn't too low. Oftentimes these patients will have very, very low calcium because the, the high sodium and the stress, we'll learn about that, stress cascade, cascade pushes sodium and potassium, um, I'm sorry, the high sodium pushes calcium, magnesium out and then calcium out later. So salt restriction is very important in this group and is corrective and therapeutic. So based on this conclusion, over 2,000 hair tissue mineral analysis, uh, many of these patients in my practice with hypertension, I now know that high calcium, low sodium, and low potassium is probably the cause of most hypertension. And in a small group, they can have high sodium uh, and in high group, high sodium, and, and it's five, about a 5% have, will have high sodium and potassium, which is usually chronic stress. And I'll explain more about how it becomes important physiology, physiologically later. But this means that 90% of the hypertension in the United States and the world is being in, treated incorrectly from not knowing mineral levels prior to treatment and medication and diet recommendations. So how does nutritional disease develop? This is a very important slide. I did not design it or make it. It always existed before me. But these are the stages that have been considered as regards to uh, nutritional disease develop. And I'll give you some examples also. It'll make a lot more sense. So you go from depletion, then you have a compensated phase where sometimes your lab tests are going to still be normal, but or maybe slightly abnormal, but your body's you know, handling it okay. Then you get an uncompensated phase where diabetes is, type two is probably the best example where your fasting blood sugar is now elevated, your triglycerides are elevated, you're beginning to, uh, to gain weight more rapidly, and then you get clinical disease which has two stages, reversible and irreversible. And in my experience, I say this here repeatedly in my talk that uh, the diabetes type two is a reversible disease up until a point. And once it's been there for too long, it becomes irreversible. So um, depletion of glucose tolerance factors, the big problem. And uh, there's certain things that uh, 
that here's an amino acid, cysteine and leucine, part of this molecule. Uh, chromate is uh, what's been developed, uh, but any GTF chromium is going to work if you take enough of it and you take it correctly to reverse diabetes early on. It'll also help control diabetes and decrease the need for multiple medications in many patients. Uh, but basically, uh, uh, phenylalanine depletes uh, chromium from the body, and it actually is probably what uh, would cause me to become diabetic about 15 years ago. And I was probably the, I was the first patient that I treated and reversed my own diabetes by taking chromium correctly. So now I've done that over 100 times. Uh, compensation, uh, increase uh, uh, insulin then happens, which results in, in uh, weight gain, and uh, so. Yeah, and you're beginning to get uh, maybe some uh, laboratory abnormalities. Fasting blood sugars beginning to rise, triglycerides become a problem, and they call this borderline diabetes, and then you get clinical disease. So this is just an example of how this is a nutritional disease. It should be treated differently in the United States today. It's not a drug deficiency. Uh, obesity and insulin resistance, this affects over 30% of children, 60% of adults in the United States. Uh, being over 20% above your di bi ideal body weight based on BMI, over 30. Uh, and BMI can be a little bit, you know, depending on your body type, a little bit less reliable, but, uh, but it's reliable based on what you feel is your normal or ideal body weight. 30% of our population is affected by uh, insulin resistance. Over 50, almost half of those are diabetic, and as we already talked about, many are going to, by 2030, 95% are projected to be insulin resistance. Treatable, reversible, preventable. Uh, it's caused in large part by chemicals like glyphosate, Roundup. 573 million pounds used in agriculture in 2012 in the United States. The worst offenders are GMO corn and soy because they can't get these weak seeds, uh, genetically modified seeds to grow in competition with weeds. So they have to keep using more Roundup to kill the weeds uh, as the weeds become more resistant to the effects of Roundup. And uh, hence these massive amounts of Roundup that are being used worldwide. Diabetes, in my experience, is always preventable and reversible. Uh, up until about two years of duration. Now, sometimes people can have it for a while before they get the diagnosis, but you know, I, I think that it's, uh, it, this is a pretty reliable statement in my experience over the past 15 years. It's not just happened overnight, and uh, as I said, I was the first person that I treated. Hypothyroidism, this is a really hot topic. A lot of you are here tonight to learn more about hypothyroidism. It's the most misunderstood, the most frequently misdiagnosis, the most poorly managed of all human diseases today, maybe except cancer, but uh, we won't get into that. Uh, we don't have time. Failure of production. So these, there's two different types, basic groups of hyperthyroidism, and it's easy to understand when I explain it like this. There's disorders of production where you're not making the hormone, and there's disorders of function where it's not working. But all of them produce the same symptoms and the same problems. So what we want to do is we want to decide, you know, what, what type of hypothyroidism. Then we can work on getting you better, as well as recognizing the, the extent of the disease and the problems. So type 1, 80% uh, of this audience tonight, I can tell you, is probably hypothyroidism. And I'm not the first one to say that. Broda Barnes in 1994 said it. Uh, and I, I could be higher, but I, that's a good number. Uh, type 1, basically, this is production. You quit making the hormone, your TSH goes up, the doctor makes the diagnosis. Most of the time, doctors, I find, don't even know the symptoms of hypothyroidism, and we're going to discuss that just a little bit, but uh, they don't know the clinical picture of hypothyroidism anymore. If you come in and you're tired, they just get a TSH, and if it's normal, they say it's not your thyroid, and I'm telling you that's going to be wrong in, in, in over 90% of the patients. Um, here's, the, here's the problem, is, uh, is this huge abnormal value for TSH levels, which goes from 0.4 to 4.5. That's what's considered normal. And the American Endocrinology Association has finally recognized that this is not reliable, and they recommended reducing it to 3.0 in 2011. But none of the laboratories are changing their normal values. They're still all using the same old values. And I don't know why how, or how long it's going to take them for them to change. I keep calling them. I keep sending them letters. They say, well, we'll change it for you, but you're the only one that's saying that. I'm like, wait a second, didn't this organization, our national standard you know, maker, uh, decide that this is what it should be? And, and how come everybody doesn't know that? Uh, so here's the problem and some of the possible causes of type 1 hypothyroidism. Obviously, if you don't have sodium, you can't get this amino acid essential for the production of the hormone into your body. If you don't have the whole food, vitamin C, or if you're taking ascorbic acid, centrum silver, you're depleting vitamin C from your body. And so then you can't make it. 
Um, and you have to, and there's certain chemicals and other, and bromine, of course, which can interfere with this whole process. And, uh, and then there's type 4 selenium. We know selenium is very, very important to the production of thyroid hormone. So I, I have seen cases of severe selenium deficiency hypothyroidism. So you can't make it. So we could say selenium is actually a type 1, cause of type 1, but it's just easy to use these numbers and to be specific for what we're talking about. So type 2 hypothyroidism is resistance, like type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance. Type 2 hypothyroidism is thyroid hormone resistance. you got normal amounts of hormone in your body, but it's not working. It's not rocket science. Uh, if you have a low basal body temperature below 97.8, you are hypothyroid, period. No exceptions, as far as I've ever seen. Uh, they may exist, but, you know, for some other reasons, but I, I haven't identified them yet. Uh, because it's so, this is such a common and prevalent disease. I call it's not epidemic; it's pandemic. So when so much of the population has it, that it's an issue, it's a big deal. So uh, we first reported this in 2008, and uh, I almost didn't do it because Mark Starr wrote his book on type 2 hypothyroidism. I'm like, okay, he's figured it out. Well, I read his book, and I realized, uh, page 67, that he he suggest, he thought it was something to do with the mitochondria, but he wasn't really sure. I'm sure this is it. It's been published previously, this normal ratio. And I've, what I did, which was kind of unique, is I was able to correlate basal body temperatures with the findings. Nobody had ever done that before. And uh, obviously, I need to publish more papers. Uh, but, you know, it's, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to do this stuff. And, and I think if somebody's really interested in my work, they're going to duplicate it or they're gonna to pay to, to hire people to come in and analyze my data and report it. But I can tell you for sure, this is type two hypothyroidism. Type three, we know is auto, there's autoimmune thyroiditis. Uh, typically, these are the two antibodies. So we, this has been referred to as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. We call, it's easy to call this type three. 30% of patients with a TSH above 2.0, which is well within the normal range, will have thyroid antibodies. So it's not normal, in my opinion, to have a TSH above 2.0. Type 5, this is an abnormality of the T3-RT3 ratio. And what's really scary about this, this is reported in 2005. I included the entire reference on here so that no one could ever say that I don't know what the heck I'm talking about. Uh, basically, uh, if you look at the physiology of thyroid hormone in the human body, you have 10 times more T4 than you have T3, and you have 10 times more RT3 than you have I'm sorry, T3, then you have RT3. If that ratio is off, something's the matter. And what they've discovered is that the, probably the worst offenders, is those people in the United States that are being treated with Synthroid. And in my experience, those patients will have a T3, RT3 ratio around two to five. Normal is uh, 10 to one at least. Uh, one expert says 10 to 14 or 12 plus or minus two is normal. But when I look at the research, which has long ago been published on these concentrations of these things that normally occurring in the body. I think it, uh, you certainly don't want to be much below 10. I will treat patients, if they're below 9.5 9, 9 on this ratio, I treat them. Um, so Dr. Wilson reported this in 1992, and, and for his contribution to the field of medicine, they took his medical license for six months and permanently restricted his right to prescribe thyroid hormone because the medical profession was so offended by his observation. So I asked my friends uh, to pray for me that they don't attack me just because I'm reporting uh, these uh, important observations. So this article was the slam dunk for the relationship between T4, to, or sorry, T3 to RT3, and how that how the, all that stuff occurs. I don't have time to get into all that physiology tonight, but uh, know that this is is correct. It's been confirmed, uh, but it's been ignored by the medical profession. This is the most important test to, for the management of thyroid hormone disease. It also can occur spontaneously in certain stress conditions because stress elevates the RT3. Uh, and due to the enzyme, the 5 prime deiodinase, and uh, so that's what the cause of it is. And we mentioned type 6 hypothyroidism. This is proven basically when they use lithium to treat bipolar disorder in the past, they showed 28% of those patients developed overt hypothyroidism, laboratory abnormal normal values. So we know that this exists. Symptoms of hypothyroidism, and now there, I, I, I counted these last night. I, I, I can't remember. It's forty something, forty-eight symptoms, or something like that. If and, you know, counting like each one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, that kind of thing. Um, but if you start going down this list of symptoms, I mean, how many people have symptoms like this on, on, in, in this audience today? I mean, raise your hand. 
most of the audience, yeah, it's about 80%. <laughs> So this it's always happens. So, you know, it's, and it's interesting that the doctors don't pay attention to this stuff. I have a patient in Oklahoma who, uh, uh, she'd been seeing the doctor for dry eyes for 10 years and been given drops and prescriptions. Nobody ever uh, had done basal body temperature or tissue mineral analysis. We discovered she had type 2 hypothyroidism. We treated it. She got better. She went to present after we made the diagnosis of the Sojourn's antibody in her bloodstream from Alaska. Um, it's because we ordered the right blood test. Uh, her, her antibodies started getting better and went away. <laughs> so she wasn't accepted into the study because she she, we cured her Sojin syndrome. So uh, I don't know about that, whether that's going to, that's one patient. I can't really tell you that that's how all of this disease and illness should be treated. But I could tell you that if you've got dry eyes, if you've got depression, you've got mood swings, you've got fatigue, you've got cold intolerance, cold hands and feet, brittle nails, hair splitting, hair loss, coarse loss of your eyebrows, the Queen Anne sign, you've got increased allergies, uh, all, these, all these symptoms, you're most likely hypothyroidism. I'm usually say if you've got five of them, you got the disease. So what happens? To, how does that change the body? Remember, thyroid is responsible for the metabolism of the body. So every physiologic process in the body is affected by thyroid, 100% of the cells. Um, so it's clinical signs of hypothyroidism, uh, these, these are some of them that are listed here. Uh, I think fatigue, lethargy, hoarse voice, this is really common. Uh, you know, slow, argumentative, just lack of energy, irritable. Uh, you know, a lot of different skin conditions are related to hypothyroidism. Most of them go away when you treat it. Um, and it, the face is puffy. Uh, and then this lists all of them. And, and if I were to examine most physicians on these signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, I would bet that, you know, I have very few could actually name them today because they, if they want to get diagnose hypothyroidism, they just do a blood test for a TSH and then they tell you it's not your thyroid. And I'm telling them that you got to pay attention to these. The clinical medicine is still very important. Um, so here's the conclusion I have. TSH is not reliable for the medical management of hypothyroidism. If you have the disease, you can't treat patients based on TSH levels, nor is it reliable for the prevention of hypothyroid-related disease complications. So here's the research on that. TSH um, cutoff points are 0.4 uh, to, oops, excuse me, my pointer, um, 0.4 to 4.5, and uh, here's the data about that, and we're gonna talk just briefly about T3, but we're gonna go kind of fast over this, because. You guys don't need all this stuff. But here's all the articles that have already been published in the years that they've been published that have shown normal TSH values with increased medical problems. So in other words, normal TSH doesn't really mean anything as far as hypothyroidism. So here's some more, it just keeps going. You know, all these normal values, uh, overt hypothyroidism, 30% uh, autoantibodies above 2.0. Here's the one that concerned me. This was published in 2010, increased risk of miscarriage, 15%. That's above the existing 15% risk. So a woman with a TSH in the normal range, 2.5 or above, has a 30% risk of miscarriage. And look at this, if she goes to 3.5, it's a 45% risk. If she's 4.5, within the normal range, a 60% risk of miscarriage. Now, should the medical profession be paying attention to this data? Absolutely. There's no such thing as borderline hyperthyroidism. There's just failure to make the correct diagnosis. So we see the same thing for T3, all these diseases and illness that are increased uh, with it. And so we can conclude that the free T3 and the TSH is not reliable for the management or diagnosis of the disease except in type one, and, uh, and that's just for the diagnosis, not for the management. We know that there's no such thing as borderline hypothyroid. These patients are virtually hypothyroid for all the reasons I've outlined, and this information confirms that all problems in pathology-related disorder of hypothyroidism are similar, just like diabetes. It's similar physiology and problems related to it, but with different specific causes which are severely underdiagnosed and largely unrecognized in most medical offices today. So this is a real problem. So here's this is a one slide list of all the diseases that are confirmed to be associated with normal TSH and hypothyroidism. It's a big, it's a big list. Uh, and it's scary that this is being missed and how much of this could be prevented by adequately treating thyroid in the United States. Uh, so here's what I suggest to be the current workup. Basal body temperature, all types. 
will have slowed metabolic rate. The metabolic rate is measured by your wake up basal body temperature. Everyone should go home and measure it. I use oral temperatures because that's what Dr. Hertog did in the 1920s when he established this normal value. And it can't be reproduced today because hypothyroidism is too pandemic. So we can't even tell what normal is until we have completely treated and eliminated all the forms of hypothyroidism in the patient. Then we could, tell, we could once again determine what's normal. The TSH is only good for type 1, hair tissue mineral analysis uh, diagnosis 2, 4, and 6. And uh, if you're above uh, 2.0, you need to do reflex antibodies on your blood testing because 30% are going to be positive and you're going to miss it if you don't. And these, again, that's normal value. Uh, total T3 versus T3 is very important. If you've ruled, all, ruled out all the other forms of hypothyroidism and they have low basal body temperature, those are the patients typically will have a stress pattern on their hair tissue analysis and they'll have an Ill, increased RT3 and a low T3. Those are the patients that benefit from just T3 therapy alone. Most everybody else needs both hormones. So the these tests are essentially no longer needed. Free T3, free T4, thyroid uptake, except in Graves' disease, and following up on TSH levels. And I've had countless patients now that they come in to the uh, doctor, since I'm not, I'm not doing any hospital or surgery stuff anymore, I'm, gonna try to I'm trying to focus on just all this knowledge information because it's so important, as you guys are seeing tonight. Um, and uh, we realize that... Um, that uh, we have to uh, begin to address these problems uh, more seriously and uh, begin to educate physicians about how to treat and recognize this properly. Uh, adrenal and thyroid are very similar because we know stress suppresses RT or increases RT3 and suppresses T3. So then these patients actually become acutely hypothyroid in addition to their adrenal issues. And so if you've had any of these problems, you've got some adrenal stress issues going on, and you may have severe depletion of your mineral, uh, I'm sorry, of your ad adrenal hormone, especially cortisol. Uh, so if you've got any history of pneumonia, any history of autoimmune disease, any chronic illness, sinusitis, uh, follicular infections, skin infections, orthostatic, stand up, drop in blood pressure, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, you may have some insulin, uh, some adrenal hormone resistance also. We know that this ratio, uh, if it's less than 4.0 of sodium to magnesium in the body, once again, sodium and magnesium, very, very important minerals, uh, you're going to be hypothyroid, I'm sorry, uh, hypoadrenal, or have function issues where it's not working. You have the hormone, it's not working. Uh, most of the time I find patients have adrenal exhaustion in, in this group where they've been putting out so much uh, cortisol for so long that they can't keep up with their needs. So they're fine on a day-to-day -day basis, but as soon as they have an insult, like an illness, they get really sick really fast and really bad. And uh, I talk about this in chapter five of my book. Uh, correct treatment is, all, is always correct sodium levels. And uh, there are some herbs and adrenal extracts that are helpful, but they're usually not necessary. Uh, cortisol, I use a lot of this in my practice based on the work of Dr. Jeffries, and yeah, it's a steroid, and yeah, and yeah, 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 but it's normal. It's a normal physiologic bioidentical steroid that exists in your adrenal glands, and what Dr. Jeffries proved in 19, and when he wrote his book and published in 1981, is that very, very low doses of cortisol are completely safe in the human, and they basically cause you, I call it vitamin cortisol, you gradually accumulate stores of cortisol in your body, so when you need it, it works. So when you need to fight off infection or things like that, it works. I actually got, I actually got the flu re recently, uh, and it lasted two hours. Seriously, two hours. I got it. I'm like, this is weird. I'm dizzy. Oh, that's all my muscles are. I can't even stand up. Next thing you know, I went to heave, and, and I came back, and I'm like, huh, it's acting like the flu. So I went and took 10 milligrams of cortisol. Within 30 minutes, it was gone. No more symptoms. So the flu, is, I talk about this in chapter five, it actually mimics a hormone in the hypothalamus that shuts off the production of cortisol and you develop acute adrenal failure in those patients uh, that have, uh, and the degree to which the adrenal, adrenal glands are failing determines the seriousness of the flu illness as you, you can't fight infection. So correct the thyroid issue is very, very important, especially the T3, RT3. Uh, you got to pay attention to this test. It's still kind of expensive because the medical profession hasn't accepted it yet. It was published in 2005. How long is it going to take? Uh, adequate vitamin C is essential for the, and certain amino acids for the production of adrenal hormones. And then uh, basically, this is something else that I, I heard Dr. Wallach say back in 1996, I believe, and he talked about animal husbandry data and preventing birth defects, and, I, and all of a sudden the bells went off in my head. I'm an, I was an OBGYN doctor for 30 years, and uh, Lord knows what a significant impact it is to have a child born with a birth defect. 
And uh, what they showed is on the farm, a 98% reduction in birth defects and a 70% reduction in miscarriage. And if you start doing the math on 120,000 babies that die every year from major birth defects, that means we would save over 60,000 deaths would be prevented every year. That's more than all this, every year. That's more than all the soldiers killed in Vietnam. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an astounding number. And, it's, and if we, all we have to do is start paying attention to mineral replacement. Now, I've actually introduced this to the March of Dimes, and they have ignored me. They haven't paid any attention to it. I went right to the head people in Anchorage and said, hey, you should study this. This is really important. You know, we've, uh, we've prevented, we spent over a billion dollars, and we've only reduced neural tube defects by 25%. And this only affects 2,500 kids per year out of 120,000 that are born. So this, this gives you some idea of how badly we're missing the mark with regards to this illness, these illnesses and diseases. We know that selenium is absolutely essential for DNA replication, spindle formation. We know that iodine, this is important, every OBGYN doctor in the United States should be recommending iodine. Why? It increases baby's IQ by over 10 points in two large studies. And the doctors have missed it. In 1995, they, they, they proved that over 50% 50, 50 of pregnant women in the United States were deficient in iodine in 18 states. It isn't in just one area. And it's pretty much because people don't use much salt, right? They're not getting enough iodine. And that's only one form of iodine, so that's another story. But this is a, this is a big deal. So bioidentical vitamins, I talk about this in chapter seven. This is a very, very important chapter. Um, I, most of this information came originally from Judith DeCava's book, uh, The Real Truth About Vitamins and Antioxidants, published in the late 90s. Very, very significant piece of work. If you look at chapter seven of the references, you can go to Amazon, you can still order it as a used book. I would covet it if you get it. It's a very, very important piece of work. Uh, but basically, the most important of all is recognize that that if you take beta carotene, it increases risk of birth defects. Drugs cause birth defects. You can drink carrot juice until you turn orange, and it won't cause birth defects. One's a drug, one's a vitamin. Uh, the B family, uh, when you see the B complex, the B complex, you know, and it's just a bunch of Bs put together, those are all chemical forms of the B molecules. They're basically stripped of all their nutrients, and they don't really work the same as the vitamins. The best example I give in the book is the World War II soldiers with uh, uh, the B, B1 or B6 deficiency in beriberi, and uh, American Red Cross sent over the B vitamin that was supposed to cure it, and it didn't work. So what do they use? Rice bran. And that's why I tell everybody, and it's one of my tips, everybody should be taking rice bran. Um, the C molecule, here's the molecule. This is why everybody's like, and you'll, you'll see all kinds of lies out there. People say, oh, we're whole food derived. Or we'll say, you know, which the ascorbic acid is whole food derived. It came from the molecule, but it's not, the, it's not vitamin C. So here's the C molecule, P factor, K factor, uh, J factor, tyrosinase, 14 known bioflavins, seven ascorbogens, five copper ions, various other minerals, and ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is merely the binding site of the molecule. So if you take ascorbic acid, you push the vitamin C out of your body. So whatever you fortunately have got from some kind of fruits or vegetables that you've been eating, you've now lost. If you buy orange juice from the store or anything that's pasteurized, it's killed. It, they can say vitamin C, and then there's the parentheses as ascorbic acid. That means we're lying to you, right? Everybody here now knows that. So it's very important. The D vitamin is not a vitamin, it's a hormone. The purpose of D is to increase calcium in the body. If you already have a calcium excess, excess or high levels of vitamin D are absolutely contraindicated. And I recognize that there's a lot of misinformation out there today. I've gone toe to toe with Dr. Mercola. We're very respectful of each other. He's got the largest medical website in the world. And I've helped him introduce this, uh, introduce this information to him. And uh, he's featured our book four times on his, our first book on his website. So he, he's read it. He understands what I'm saying. Uh, uh, for some reason, he still advocates high levels of vitamin D, but I, I, I don't see it as, as, a, as a reliable thing. Remember, it's a hormone. Enough's enough. You want to have the correct dose of, of vitamin D. We know deficiency causes diseases, uh, but too much can increase your calcium. If it's already high, that's a bad problem. The E molecule is also a complex molecule, and uh, if you get the succinate or acetate form that they market, uh, if it says vitamin E parentheses as uh, uh, alpha tocopherol succinate or alpha tocopherol acetate, that means you're getting in a completely inert fat that has no effect in the human and it's basic physiology. It's already reduced. The bodies can't de-esterify compounds. It's an ester. And humans, only rats can. So rats can become fertile, 
but humans it doesn't have any effect. And it's begin, it's in a lot of studies it's shown to increase risk of prostate cancer and many other problems. Uh, stress, we talked about that briefly, stress uh, trumps calcium. If you were playing cards and you played poker or euchre or something where there's a trump, you would understand these. Uh, basically, uh, the hair tissue mineral analysis is required to diagnose this accurately. You can't predict it. We all have stress and it affects us negatively always. And if we're not walking 30 minutes every day, it's going to have an effect on our physiology. Walking 30 minutes every day is unbelievable. It does more for your body's stress physiology than any other activity that you can do. It builds relationships. It creates peace. It doesn't cost hardly anything. It creates dramatic changes in physiology and reduces risk of heart disease, stroke, cancer, and I include divorce just because <laughs> it's so powerful in building relationships. And I have stories which I could share, but I, I'm not going to go, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but here's the problem. Stress increases uh, certain cortical uh, hormones out of the adrenal glands, which causes sodium retention first. If you're retaining sodium, you're going to lose magnesium from the adrenal effect. And because uh, you have increased adrenal hormone, retain magnesium. Suppress adrenal hormone, lose magnesium. And so this stress, if it's chronic, you have both high sodium tests, and we talked about that with the blood pressure issues later. So it's a little bit more common in men and in, in type A personalities. Uh, uh, but it's a very essential thing. Here's the six things I tell everybody to do, and I apologize, in the book it says seven things. Somehow, it, it, it came out six things in the book, and I called Kathleen, and I said, it lists seven, Kathleen. That's, I, how come the, the proofreader didn't pick that up? So I said, I told her, we either have to change it to seven things, or we have to take the number off seeds. Seeds should not have a number in the book. Seeds are just unique because they are two, three, four, and five. They contain uh, minerals, they contain whole food vitamins, they contain essential fatty acids, and they contain protein. So there's no food source that I know of that contains more essential nutrients for us than raw seeds. Um, good water is very important. Alkaline is great, and it may be important. Many people think that it has an impact on uh, reducing cancer. Uh, and then all these whole food vitamins, of course, never the drug ones, essential fatty acids, uh, and then protein and monosaccharides. Most people have never heard of monosaccharides. And uh, probably the only natural source of monosaccharides is tree sap syrup. So these are the things that I say everybody needs to know to continue to be healthy. So what are the two most important things you put in your body every day? Water and minerals. We're 72% water, 28% minerals. Never scramble eggs. Don't ever eat them. If you're going to have an omelet, take out the yolk. If you're going to have French toast, take out the yolk. If you're going to make meatloaf, take out the yolk. If you're going to bake, take out the yolk and use King Arthur flour so you don't get bromine. Family history is largely uh, family eating habits and preferences. We tend to go to the store and buy what we like. We buy it repetitively, and then we end up with mineral imbalances related to that, which we can't recognize until we do tissue mineral analysis. So I'm convinced that most things that the medical profession causes family disease is not disease. It's family nutrition. Uh, and we need to begin to change that meaningfully. Um, this is also, I, I get questions all the time about ADD, ADHD, things like that. It's mineral imbalance every time. It's not a diagnosis. It's not a disease. It's not a deficiency of Ritalin. It can be completely treated and reversed by correcting these mineral imbalances. And if you don't, we know that the sociopaths in our prisons typically have the ADD pattern. Uh, there's, this has been reported now in over 3,000 severe criminals. And uh, they've actually differentiated them into two groups. And uh, of course, there's other issues. But this is very, very important. Uh, we got to know minerals to diet and supplement correctly. We need to know disease is not supposed to be big business. We're not supposed to make more money because more people are sick. We're supposed to, in the medical profession, keep people from getting sick. That's our job. We're not doing our job. Uh, treating symptoms of disease is never getting anyone better. We must treat the underlying causes of diseases. Uh, we must, these are very, very important nutrients. Uh, stabilized rice bran is magnificent. It has over 72 nutrients in it. It's very high in B1, B3, and B6. It's been featured on the Dr. Oz show. Uh, the only place I know you can get it in Anchorage is uh, Datchel Pantry, but if anybody else knows other places, please tell me. Uh, it's high in B1, B3, B6, so you need B1 for thyroid, B3 to metabolize cholesterol, utilize copper, B6 for magnesium utilization. So. Uh, always get whole food vitamins and never, ever, ever, ever take or drink or, or put anything in your body that's got ascorbic acid in it. Uh, maple syrup is very, very high and or it's high comparatively to any other. It's about 2% monosaccharides. I did confirm that in a reference. I can't tell you which ones. The guy that really knew this information had a stroke and I can't get any information anymore about that. Uh, 
uh, I think you forgot everything. Avoid bromine. Uh, iodine uh, is really, really important to, cut, to uh, counteract the effects of bromine. So the biggest, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that if the iodine increases IQ over 10 points, and we know that there's a disruption of the brain that occurs in autism, I wonder how important bromine is in the development of autism. Do you know this has not been researched? There's absolutely no references on this in the literature to date that I, I've been able to find, and I keep looking. Uh, I think this is a very, very important observation. And uh, chromate, uh, uh, chromate is, a, is the only thing that I know of so far that seems to reverse insulin resistance. It's probably very important. So these are the lies that I talk about in this book, and you can see that it's just not one or two lies. It's a huge number of lies uh, that the medical profession believes without justification based on science. Remember, science is observable, repeatable, and teachable. And so you have to have certain things that are met, certain criteria to be real science. So calcium, obviously that's not the answer. Ascorbic acid, the vitamin C lie, that's not the answer. Watch your sodium, that's obviously a lie, 90%. Cholesterol, so many people are using egg beaters and all kinds of substitutes when really what they should be eating is eggs, just not scrambling them. Your thyroid, it's not your thyroid. You go diet and exercise. What a lie. You know, I tell everybody, get off the roller coaster. Treat the underlying issue. You don't ever gain the weight back again if you treat the underlying issue. It's quite simple. And uh, mineral decline is a lie. There's no excuse for it as we age except inadequate intake. And the sodium pump lie, we talked about that. So thank you very much for coming tonight. I have run over a few minutes, uh, but I do, I, I, I feel like the message is pretty important. We are videotaping it. We are gonna put it on YouTube. We're gonna have CDs available at some point. And uh, I think that uh, it's very important that you, if you love people and you care about them, you need to share this message. Each one of y'all has now you know, heard it. You've seen it. You know it's real science. You know I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, secondly, uh, you want to encourage your doctor to start caring again and, and, and really start trying to get patients better, not by treating the symptoms with some sort of drug, but start, start with accurate nutritional information and begin to make a difference in your patients. Um, if you have any information that would contradict anything that I've said, I am not about being right. I'm about getting it right. And so, uh, send it to me or call me or something. I had a doctor, a chiropractor in Homer that after I wrote the first book, he observed something in my book that was wrong and he was right. And I thanked him and I'm like, oh, you know, that's a typo. It, should, it said two layers of fat and one layer of protein. It was supposed to be two layers of protein, one layer of fat, but he was the only one that picked it up. And I'm like, How, what a smart guy. And he actually sent me the reference from the book that showed it. Well, I finished doing my homework at that point and I discovered that it's really, I was pretty much correct. The new book reflects that. Our membranes are mostly fat with protein molecules interspersed. It's not a layer of protein. So um, we're mostly fat in our cells and our bodies. So what kind of fat? The quality of the fat that goes in our body is very, very important. So when I talked about people eating fast food, I said, well, it's, the fast food isn't really the issue. It's the bad fat. So be sure that you, if you're going to do fast food, try to get a, make wise fat choices. So um, remember that if somebody wants to sell you supplements, be discerning. Uh, if you can't know for sure that it's reliable nutritional information that they're giving you, and they'll lie. They'll tell you, oh, this has been FDA approved. They'll say, which means it's been inspected and it's pharmaceutically uh, meets the standards for pure pharmaceutical substance. It has nothing to do that they're certifying that it is what you say it is. You have to get a certificate of analysis from an independent source, third party, that says, uh, that it is what they say it is. And if they put a molecular weight of, I think it's about 170, and they tell you it's vitamin C, you know they're lying to you. That's ascorbic acid. And almost everything on the literature is ascorbic acid now on the internet. So you know you can't believe that either. Um, you gotta be doing the basics. It doesn't really matter what you're doing to try to be more healthy. If you're not doing these basics that I talk about in here, taking your minerals every day, getting whole food C into your body, and taking iodine, you're probably going to have problems down the road that are very, very significant. And we've talked about what some of those are. So I'll finish with my grandson, absolutely adorable, six months in this picture. He's about nine months now. My daughter, she's a neonatal intensive care nurse. My son plays for Tampa Bay Lightning. All these, um, I'm of course proud of these young ones. And uh, uh, he was supposed to be assistant captain of Team USA the last two years, so he's supposed to be on the Olympic team, but he didn't get chosen. And uh, that's a coaching issue. We'll, we'll, I'll talk about that only privately. <laughs>
And this is why I live in Soldotna. I have a, uh, live on a lake down there, which I couldn't afford in Anchorage. And I got a beautiful view of the mountains. And this is a sunrise in November. And as you know, the sun comes up pretty horizontally in the, in the wintertime in Alaska. And some of the most beautiful sunrises you'll ever see occur. So uh, please uh, understand that, you know, I'm speaking truth. I care about everyone that I take care of, everyone that I see. Uh, I, I care about my staff, um, and I, I'm hoping that more and more physicians will begin to pay attention to, uh, to what I'm saying. Uh, and thank you very, very, very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have... Um, to be out of here in about uh, 15 minutes. Um, is that correct, Charlotte? I'm sorry? It's fine if we go a little bit longer. All right, well, let's take just a few questions. We've got some microphones uh, that you can use. And uh, I may, I'm very, very diff hard of hearing. So if I don't hear you, they'll repeat the question from out there. If they do hear you, if I do hear you, I'll repeat the question up here because we're recording. We want everybody to know the answers. You know the microphone. Hi, can you tell me what your take on Himalayan salt is? Can you hear what she said? Himalayan salt. Himalayan salt. Himalayan salt. Himalayan salt. Great question. Uh, the question is, what about Himalayan salt? Well. Uh, any sea salt is really going to be good for you. If you go to the grocery store and you look in uh, the, the salt areas of the grocery store, you'll see that uh, you'll see this like Morton looking salt shaker and one of them will say sea salt and the other one will say iodized sea salt. Both of those mean we're lying to you. Okay, because sea salt is naturally iodized. It's a super saturated solution. The whole problem was we quit using sea salt. So that's why we developed this problem with goiters and cretinism and things like that when we quit preserving our meat and our fish and went to table salt, pretty white table salt. So uh, Himalayan salt is iodized. It contains all the minerals. There are some slight variations in concentrations of uh, minerals worldwide among the, the various sea salts. Uh, Dr. Watts, who's responsible for the tissue mineral analysis company that I recommend because they're so reliable, reproducible, he suggests that it's slightly higher in aluminum, uh, but I haven't observed that in my clinical practice. But sea salt is really fun. Uh, I don't know if you've experienced it, but if you know you need it, oh my gosh, there's so many different flavors of sea salt, you know, that you can pour on your food, like hickory on your, on your uh, meat and, and uh, alder on your fish and chicken, and, and there's merlot and habanero infused and all these different flavors. <laughs> of sea salt, which are magnificent for cooking. And if you know you need it, you can pour it on. If somebody else in your family doesn't need it, you can put it on after. Go ahead. But Himalayan is a good salt. Uh, I, I generally recommend Celtic sea salt, but I don't have any loyalty to that company. And I use so many different types that you, you would be shocked if you were in my house. Go ahead. You mentioned not, uh, not eating scrambled eggs. Is it the cooking of the egg yolk? And what about a whole egg in a smoothie? He's, uh, okay, uh, good question. It's, it's the cooking process of the egg that causes the yolk to turn bad by exposing it to oxygen. So the membrane, as long as that membrane's intact on the yolk, it's protecting that good cholesterol from oxygen. But as soon as you rupture it, oxygen goes right to it and it causes it to turn into bad fat. So it's, it's the rupturing of the yolk that's what's the problem when, and heating it. If you want to eat it raw, it's fine. Yeah, you probably ought to put a little vodka in there so that you kill the salmonella, but, you know, like they do in the, in the what is it, in the uh, detective movies, you know, where you got the derelict alcoholic detective, that's what they do. Go ahead, sorry. And with the increase of salt intake, how does that affect the blood pressure issue? Can't hear. Always, always associated with in, in, uh, increase of salt intake. How does increase of salt intake affect the blood pressure? Okay, um, it, it depends. Again, what type do you have? Do you have high salt or low salt hypertension? If you've got low salt hypertension, in my experience, it's going to get better over time by using more salt. Because remember, that's really important to your body's physiology and the problem is arginine. So a lot of times if they have low salt, I say use more salt and take arginine. And I put a patient on sustained release L-arginine a couple times a day. I usually have them take it at bedtime because then it helps growth hormone in the morning and in the morning because it's going to last 
good throughout a good part of the day. All diabetics, I always put all those in arginine because it helps circulation. We want to stimulate nitric oxide. We want to dilate blood vessels, and that's why using more salt helps it, help it, helps it go away because it helps arginine get into the cells. Can cataracts be um, reversed? Can cataracts be reversed? Can cataracts be reversed? You know, I don't know. Uh, I have to say that many times. I try to be as honest as I can about everything I conclude and, and say I just don't know. I, I think that uh, oftentimes when you get illness and disease, like if you get degeneration of a joint, you can't make that degeneration go away by correcting your nutrition. And uh, it's better off to be on the good nutrition and not get the joint problem to begin with. I'm convinced that, and I talk about this in chapter seven, all our joint problems and joint replacement problems and back problems and knee problems, ligand problems and tendon problems, things like that are largely related to using ascorbic acid and thinking it's vitamin C. Um, I do, uh, you know, with my son playing pro professional hockey, I, I really advocate, I mean, the whole Tampa Bay Lightning team, don't tell the rest of the NHL, but they're all using whole food vitamin C. And Stamkos had a tibial fracture uh, in November. He's skating in the Olympics. That's in three and a half months. That's unheard of. Uh, it's, that's the biggest bone in the body. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's quite remarkable. So the vitamin C is very, very powerful in the human. And uh, deficiencies of it are largely related to much of the illness that we're seeing and treating in the United States today. Yes? Uh, if ascorbic acid is not good, what about buffered C or S or C? Uh, bad. Those are all lies. Emergency, ester C, buffered C, sodium ascorbate, none of that is the C molecule. You have to get that whole molecule. You need all those other factors and enzymes and ions and minerals and, and everything that's in that molecule is one molecule and that's what works in the human body. Pieces of that act like drugs. They can have effects. Ascorbic acid can have effects in the body and we're still discerning what some of those can be. There are some good ones. It can kill viruses because it increases peroxide inside the cells. So it's a pro-oxidant, not an antioxidant. We know that vitamin C is an antioxidant. That should be a clue that it's not vitamin C, right? And so I've been telling the medical profession, every time I go to another integrative medicine meeting, I'm always standing up and they're getting tired of me and finally they're gonna ask me to talk, I guess, at this next meeting. But uh, I keep saying, quit calling ascorbic acid vitamin C, it's a lie. Call it ascorbic acid and, and figure out what it's good for and use it for that, but don't try to replace C with it, yes? Um, how about use of molasses for the iodine? I can't hear. Can she use molasses for iodine? Yeah, I'm not sure, I know molasses is high in magnesium. Uh, if you have a magnesium deficiency, molasses, hummus, uh, garbanzo beans. There's a few other things that are that are helpful. I don't know what the iodine content of uh, molasses is, uh, so I can't help you on that. I recommend 12.5 milligrams a day of iodine, which is about a hundred times, yeah, ten times, a hundred times the RDA. The reason I say that is because it can't hurt you unless you have three conditions: a toxic nodule, a uh, Graves' disease untreated. So hyper, hyper, hyperthyroidism. If you're hyperthyroid, you have to treat that problem first before you give iodine or you could produce something called a judd basto effect, which is, you don't have to know about that. It's just basically a thyroid storm, too much thyroid hormone. Um, but uh, basically, if you're doing the total T3 R, T3 in patients, it doesn't matter how much T3 you get, uh, how much thyroid hormone you give the patients. If that T3 total is normal, you're not hyperthyroid, period ever, in my experience. Uh, you were talking about the um, amount of minerals lost per baby, or like four pounds of minerals I'm, lost. I, I was I'm, wondering about placenta encapsulation. I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry, can you say it again? He was talking about, he was talking about four pounds of, baby, of minerals lost per childbirth. Four pounds of minerals lost per childbirth. Four pounds of minerals per okay. pregnancy. Her pregnancy. So my question is, uh, I've heard about uh, placenta encapsulation after. So placenta encapsulation? After, after giving birth? birth? Does that Any help what? at all? Placenta encapsulation after giving birth. Does that help at all? Placenta encapsulation. Oh, uh, I think, are you talking about the calcification of the placenta? No. Um, encapsulation. There's, there's yeah, people taking. have uh, taken. After you have the placenta. Oh, when you're breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. 
keep taking is the minerals. That, does that help with mineral deficiency at all? To consume the placenta. I, I still don't understand. To consume the placenta after you have the baby. Oh, do you get minerals from that? Yeah. 28%. <laughs> 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 That's the best I could tell you. It's, it's a popular thing now. Yeah, 28%. Um, I, 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 I understand uh, people do different things, but <laughs> obviously it would probably be more healthy for you to just to take lots of minerals. Uh, than, than, you know, than eating a placenta. But, you know, some people do that because there's iron in there and a few other things, but most people don't need iron. What do they need? Vitamin C. You can't utilize iron without vitamin C. Every person, I've said so many patients in my practice have been anemic their whole life, and they come in to see me, I put them on the whole food C, and within three months their anemia is completely gone. They're never anemic again. Yes? May we substitute birch syrup for maple syrup? Yes, any tree sap syrup is... I think going to contain, uh, based on the literature that I know, 2% monosaccharides. Uh, so the list of those essential monosaccharides up there, you get at least four of them, according to the, the guy that knew this stuff. But as I said, there's about six of them. I don't know which are the four that you get specifically from syrup. Uh, but um, these sugar molecules are critical to human physiology. I oftentimes get questions about eat for your blood type, that book. That's a perfect example of hocus pocus. Um, if you eat to be more healthy, you will get more healthy. So what happens is when people start focusing on that book uh, and they try to eat better, what happens? They get more healthy. This is such a powerful tool in the field of medicine. When I have patients that smoke cigarettes, for example, I will tell them, you know, just pick one thing to be more healthy. How many people pick one thing? Well, everybody will pick one, but then they'll do two. And then when they do two, they do four. And then when they do four, they do eight. And then they start taking, they start feeling better. They start having more energy. And I'm like, pretty soon, if you're spending money on supplements and you're getting better and feeling better, you know, it's way much easier to quit smoking cigarettes and quit doing destructive things to your health. Uh, so it's just, it becomes an attitude of uh, pursuing uh, healthfulness that really makes a difference in these patients. So I just love them into quitting smoking every chance I can. Yes. Do you, do you do the IV uh, vitamin C push? And I, IV vitamin C? Yeah, I don't want to step on too many toes about that because I know a lot of people feel really, really powerfully about it, you know, and they get a benefit from it. When you get an IV vitamin C, you're killing bacteria and viruses potentially in your blood. And it may have some benefits with cancer treatment. They're doing research, and uh, I think it's University of Kansas. Uh, Jeannie Drisco has been doing lots of research on this, and I keep telling her, Jeannie, it's, it's not vitamin C. Quit calling it vitamin C. So Jeannie, if you're watching this, I'm saying it again. Okay, it's not new. I've said it right to you. As soon as you did your hour presentation on ascorbic acid, one of the most sophisticated presentations ever uh, with her PhD student, a very, very magnificent presentation, Vitamin C is a pro-oxidant. It causes increased peroxide, which kills viruses, bacteria, potentially cancer cells. So there may be some benefit to ascorbic acid, but it always, always, always depletes vitamin C from the body. So you better get on vitamin C, the real stuff, if you've had an IV vitamin C, and take fairly large amounts of it for some period of time because you are really pushed all the vitamin C out of your body. I don't know about all, but a lot. I don't know how much. I mean, you know, a lot of times people measure ascorbic acid in the urine, and they think that that's a measurement of how much vitamin C they're putting in. Well, it's really not. It's just a measure of how much ascorbic acid is in there. Now, if you're taking the whole food vitamin C and you measure the ascorbic acid, you're probably measuring it accurately. But if you're not taking the whole food vitamin C, you're just measuring what you put in. Yes. Uh, no, I use a lot of Armour Thyroid because it's very inexpensive and it contains the two hormones, T4 and T3, at the correct ra typical ratio of 4 to 1. And that's a good starting point. 
Uh, it's usually easier to take. It's not FDA approved. I have no idea why. Um, and a lot of doctors really poo poo it. I had one doctor that called me up and was, you know, literally chewing me out over the phone because I was going to give his, his patient mad cow disease by giving her armor thyroid. And I'm like, well, that's funny. It comes from pigs. How are you going to get armor th uh, mad cow disease from pigs? So, um, yeah, the answer is yes. But, and I thought armor thyroid was really a, kind of a better way to treat patients. They f certainly feel better faster because they get a T3 ratio, our T3 ratio of about five to nine, which is closer to 10. So they always feel better sooner with armor thyroid once you get it to appropriate dose to overcome levels of resistance and other issues we've talked about tonight. When you test, you use the hair, right? Because I did the volume test. No, use base of body temperature for thyroid disease. That's your reliable test. If your temperature's low, you're still hypothyroid, even on the dose you're taking. But everybody has a little bit different tolerance for how much thyroid hormone they can take. And once you start seeing effects on the temperature, I start focusing a little bit more on that T3, RT3 ratio to get it right. And if that ratio is right, then patients feel so much better, it's unbelievable. So what do you think of the Ryan test? Nothing. I'm sorry? The Ryan test. The Ryan? R-H-E-I-N, Ryan? Ryan test? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about it. Oh. I'm sorry, you'd have to educate me. What is it? <laughs> Urine. I'll look it up. <laughs> Write it down for me, I'll look it up. Now I'll learn All something. Right. I always love it when I learn something new from patients. I'll write it down for you. Okay, good. <laughs> Jerry. From the hair analysis, from the hair analysis, are you able to determine some of these issues you've discussed tonight, other than the thyroid, like diabetes and hypertension? And uh, that's a good question. Um, yes, uh, there are quite a few other illnesses and conditions that uh, can be discerned through the hair tissue mineral analysis. ADD is a perfect example. Uh, now, those patients can also have thyroid conditions, uh, both high and low. But it's, uh, it's mineral imbalance is, a, is a, the main contributor. So uh, there's uh, seven essential ratios that have been determined to be significant in human physiology. The two most important, I think, are the sodium uh, magnesium and the calcium potassium ratio. But those tell you about thyroid and adrenal issues. And then you've got calcium phosphorus, which tells you about energy and protein digestion. You've got sodium potassium, which tells you about fluid mechanics and retention in the body. And then you've got um, the, the uh, zinc-copper ratio, which affects hormones, connective tissue, and, uh, and uh, calcium-magnesium, which affects muscle tension, ability to form stones and plaque, and iron-copper, which affects the ability to produce hemoglobin in the body and to utilize iron in biochemical pathways for things like synthesis of MAO inhibitors and things like that. So there's a ton of information that can be gained from that test. Uh, and uh, you can really start to make ma very meaningful changes in your health over time through having that information. It's, it's very impressive. Uh, and I, I think the problem is, is there's, there's uh, three labs, I think in the United States, doctor's data in Chicago, they don't even report a calcium potassium ratio on their test. And when I look at their reports, I can't interpret them. And I, I have probably had as much experience of minerals and interpretation of this with physiology as anybody in the world. I can't interpret their data. I think it's reliable. It's just how they present it, and they don't have the most critical calcium potassium ratio on their report. So I can't recommend them, but I don't have anything against their lab. I think they do good work. Uh, and they certainly care about it. So if they're going to listen to me, hopefully, and, and update their, their information, they could be much more well uh, accepted from my standpoint. Uh, there's also a, a lab in, in, in uh, Phoenix, I don't know the name of it, they do fairly reliable results. That guy was a partner of Dr. Watts originally, and there was some bad blood there, uh, and Dr. Watts has the largest experience, largest database, the most scientific, he's the brains behind it, he's got the PhD in biochemistry, and uh, I mean, he speaks biochemistry more fluently than any person I've ever spoke to. Uh, including my professors in medical school. The guy's a genius. And uh, so when he, and he won't make any claims about anything that he says without proof, scientific proof. So for instance, he won't, if you're germanium deficient, he won't tell you that that has any significance in humans because there's no research. We can't experiment on humans to uh, 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 make them germanium deficient. That would be inhumane and unacceptable. 
But in animals, we have observed that germanium deficiency is associated with immune, immune dysfunction. So when I have a patient with germanium deficiency, I replace it because it's easily corrected. And it's pretty common, actually. So um, I think that's, that's kind of like one of the other examples of how you can do other things and affect other physiologies with this mineral information. One more question. Somebody that hasn't asked one? Well, he had one. You can ask it. Because we've got to let Charlotte go home here from the library. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. All right. Um, how long does the hair tissue mineral analysis last? Or how far, you know, if I get one now, is it going to be good six months from now? Great question. Um, probably. Um, to some degree. I, I think that it's very difficult to change the body's physiology. It takes time. Uh, for the best example, I did my first hair tissue analysis in 2000, and my response was much like every other doctor when the nurse, uh, actually it was, yeah, it was a uh, naturopathic doctor actually introduced me to it. And uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, and I poo-pooed it, like most doctors say, ah, it's not reliable. And all of a sudden, I got the silent treatment, you know, and I'm kind of like, okay, I better do my homework. I did my homework, find out she was right. It really was accurate. So I did it, and sure enough, I found that my potassium level was two. Well, after eight years of taking potassium, my potassium was up to four. Eight years, and I knew it was low. I was doing all the diet supplements, things like that, to bring it up. So that's why I started using Spurlactone in 2008 to help it. And within the next three years, in three years, so less than half the time, I more than doubled my potassium. I was up to nine in the next three years. So I went from four to nine in three years, where I'd only gone from two to, two to four in eight years prior to that. So it takes time to change these things. Stress is the pattern that changes the fastest. If I have a patient with a stress pattern on hair tissue mineral analysis and high sodium, and they listen and they walk every day 30 minutes, I tell them you need to come back and do another hair tissue mineral analysis in six to 12 months because you're gonna have a fairly significantly different uh, presentation at that point of your uh, mineral levels. But if you had a high calcium, a low potassium, I'd say one to two years. Now, I know there's people in the United States that they'll do them every three months, and I, I think it's a little bit like a dog chasing your tail. You know, you're really never going to catch it if you're doing them that often. And so I kind of think it's, it's, it's a waste of money. Uh, I think it's a lot, changing your mineral status of your body is like, a lot like driving a big boat. You point it in the right direction. You don't make a lot of turns, there are just some adjustments here and there, and it's going to a destination and it's gonna take you there, and that's where you wanna be. Uh, and you wanna get there as quickly as you can, and, but safely. And uh, so I think that it's, uh, it's, it's a long-term improve your health issue that's profound. It really is profound. It changes lives, it changes everybody's eating habits more than anything I've ever seen. Even teenagers will change their eating habits. They won't listen to me. They won't listen to their parents. But they read this report. They're very literal. Next thing you know, they start changing their diet because they don't want to grow up and get the problems that the report says they're going to get if they don't change. And it's, it's remarkable how, actually, how effective it is and how useful a tool it is in practicing medicine. We got just a little bit of time to sign books if anybody else wants one. Uh, I'll try to answer questions as, as much as I can from here on out. And uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, you're now my disciples. You spread the message on minerals uh, to everyone you know and love. And uh, if you have questions and it's not in the book, uh, please contact our office. I'll be happy to, uh, happy to follow up with more answers about that.